but this, this is a sermon that Dad Hagen preached a number of, time, number of years ago. And, um, and to be honest with you, he didn't get it originally. He got it out of Dake's Annotated Bible. <laughs> what to do when faith seems weak and victory lost. And I think we've all faced that before. Amen? Times in your life where faith doesn't seem like it's working. It looks like your victory is a long way away. Now, that's just, uh, you got to understand, that seems like that. It doesn't make it true. Just because you feel something doesn't make it true. Amen? That's why the Bible tells us we walk by faith and not by sight. Because I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a day as you feel like it. That you, how many of you ever woke up and didn't feel saved? Now, don't men, don't men, don't try using this one. If you woke up tomorrow morning and said, I don't feel married and told your wife, I'm going to go find me another wife. Um, please make sure that I have all the information that you want in your funeral prior to that event. Because you will probably, I'll probably be doing your funeral the next week. All right. Uh, let's read 1 John chapter 5 verse 4. It says, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I like this. You know, uh, I like faith people. And the writers of the New Testament were faith men. Amen. Amen. They, they, they talk in absolutes. They don't talk in maybe so's. John writes here and says, and the, the, whatsoever is born of God overcometh. Didn't say what's there born of God might overcome. Didn't say one day the circle will, will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. You know, I mean, you know, here I stand on Jordan's stormy banks looking over in the Canaan land. I mean, you know, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. I'm going to tell you something. You better be singing and shout the victory now. Whether you see Jesus or not. Amen. The faith walk rejoices now. Amen. Amen. And so John writes with a definitive statement, whatsoever born of God overcometh the world. Not might overcome, you're an overcomer. You are born an overcomer. It is your nature to overcome. You are, the, you are, your genetic disposition as a new creature in Christ is victory. Amen. Now your head might be going, oh, I don't see no victory, and I don't feel no victory. Oh, well, victory, listen, think about Jesus. The Bible says in Romans um, um, chapter 12. Mm -mm, Hebrews, Hebrews, I'm sorry. I was mixed up Hebrews and Romans. Re Hebrews chapter 12, it says that who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame of the cross. What was it? Even in dying on the cross and pouring out his soul into death and becoming sin for us who knew no sin, he already had the victory on the other side. Uh, when, you, when you study that and you go look at what he said, remember, remember when they, the 22nd Psalm where it says, and they gaped upon me with their mouths and I was in the midst, you know, and, 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 and the, the, the bowls of Bashan and count, encompassed around about me. Then he, he began to say this, yet in the midst of of the brethren while I declare thy, thy praises. He begins to confess. The psalmist, and really um, most scholars believe Jesus quoted the 22nd Psalm on the cross. We have reference to the beginning and the end of it. Um, my God, my God, what has thou forsaken me? And it is finished. The, key, the Hebrew, I mean the uh, King James says at the end of the 22nd Psalm, he hath done that, but that is a Hebraism that means it is finished. Okay, so Jesus quoted the whole 22nd Psalm. He said, I will, I will praise you in the midst of the brethren. While he's dying on the cross, becoming sin for us who knew no sin, pouring out his soul into death, he's confessing. And he, he, that's pretty, these are pretty dire circumstances. When's the last time you were being crucified and dying and you had to make a faith confession you were going to be raised up and still praise God? Anybody? All right, I mean, <laughs> didn't think so. Yeah, we get uptight because we got to believe God for, you know, a, 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 a new car. Look, I know, I'm, not, I'm not mocking that. I understand we all get in those places. And there's times it looks like, what Bill Hagen used to say, he said, I would tell the Lord, live or die, sink or swim, go over, go under. I'm still going to walk this way. And he said, it looked like I'd do all of it. Live, die, sink, swim, and go over and under. Anybody ever felt like you were on, on all the negative sides? 
that was a hidden question. You can respond. All right. John says uh, that we overcome, and, th and, and then the victory that overcomes the world is, is our faith. Even our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You are surrounded. <clears throat> you are surrounded by negative circumstances. How many, how many pay one bill one day, and the next day here comes another, and you think, I thought I just paid the bill. Ever been there? I mean, I just got them all unloaded, and here they come again. Well, the only, the only difference is last month it said due on November the 1st. This month it says due December the 1st. You're looking at all that, and they just, you know, they just keep, you know, th those things just keep pressing. They keep pressing, but you know what? We can keep pressing in by faith. We can keep living by faith. Do you, th do you think about how many times they tried to take Jesus out, how the pressure was always against Jesus all the time? Pressure was always against Paul. Remember that? I mean, Paul listed that whole litany of things that he had been through at, at one time trying to brag and show that he, had, he was more qualified than other people just in, in a sarcastic way. You know, Paul would do that sometimes. But, you know, all the things, you know, f uh, Three times received out the forty sight stripes, save one. The night and the day and the deep, let down the wall. You know this, and he just goes on and on and on. And fastings often, and nakedness often, and hunger's thirst often. Da 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 da. On and on and on and on. Yeah, he still lived by faith and not by sight. Even they tried to kill him, and he said, I'm, "He said this in one place. He finally came and said, 'I'm at a, I'm at a, I'm in a difficult place. Whether to die and be with Christ, which is far greater, or to remain in the flesh, which is needful for you, but because you need me, I'm staying.'" Later, he writes back to Timothy and says, "I'm ready to be offered up. I've finished my, fa I've kept my faith. I finished my course. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness." And then he was, then he was, um, uh, then he was, you know, martyred. But he, they couldn't do it until he said, I'm ready. I've finished. I've done everything I need to do. So I, what I'm trying to say is, you may feel like everything's going against you. But if you, if you just keep walking by faith and keep, you keep your fix, keep your focus, keep your gaze on the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you come out a winner. It's just the way you're designed. You, you know, uh, Doyle Tucker had that old song, you just can't keep a good man down. Amen. All right. But when faith seems weak and victory lost, here's some steps we can do to reestablish our thinking and our ways so that we don't go under. We shouldn't be going under. You know, uh, I think the number is 1,500 churches a year close their doors. A year. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 plus ministers quit the ministry. Now, I can tell you, now, you know, anybody that's been in the ministry at all knows there is a constant pressure to quit. And the devil will use the one thing consistently and constantly to try to get you to quit. People. They're the ones that will turn on you. They're the ones that are hurt. The ones that you, you've given and sown into and blessed and helped. They'll turn on you. And they'll, they'll try to take the joy out of serving. But, you know, there's more people out there you got to help. And a lot of times you don't get to hear from the people who you've helped. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'll go somewhere to another church and there'll be somebody, you know, somebody that used to, who came to our church for a little while. Oh, Pastor Ed, you helped me so much. You blessed my life so much. You just don't know. God has us up here, but we love you. You're awesome. You know, sometimes you think, well, why didn't you just stay with us? <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, there's still people to help. The devil will use that. One guy said one time, he said, uh, I would love the ministry if it wasn't for the people. Well, <laughs> that's why you're there, Bozo. You know, but that, that, that kind of joke, you know, uh, you know, remember Moses one day, was uh, the Lord was going to wipe him out. He goes out and says, no, Lord, no, you can't do that. Won't you do right? And it won't be just a few weeks later. He's like, Lord, take him out. <laughs> one minute he's interceding for him. Next, he's begging God to take them out, <laughs> you know. And so even in people in ministry, understand, you, you deal with stuff. But the fact of the matter is, we have to, number one, recognize the source. People turning on you is the devil using them. Now, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. There are some people who have a higher propensity to be used of the devil than others. But it's just the, the source of that whole thing is the devil. John 10.10 10. 
the source of the problem, John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life, Zoe, have Zoe life, and have it more abundantly, or have it to the full. And um, so we understand our source, uh, the, not our source, but the source of the problem is the devil. Everybody say, the devil. Now, the devil didn't make you do it, and the devil didn't make them do it, but they were, they were vessels in his hands to be used. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, who's my adversary? Who? Yeah. Your brother-in-law is not your, your adversary. And your mother-in-law, mother-in-law, mother-in-law. You remember that song? Three of you remember that song. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, anyway. They're not your adversary. The opposite, uh, the opposite party of your political affiliation is not your adversary in the spirit. Now, maybe the natural they are, but not in the spirit. All right. They're not, your, they're not your spiritual adversary. But it says here, be, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as, now he is, he is not a roaring lion, but as a roaring lion. Why? Because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Satan was, is always trying to imitate the Lord. He's always trying to place himself as some great one. Can somebody turn off the heat? I don't know about y'all. It's getting stuffy. Of course, our... our uh, Mark and Eliza are from um, a part of the country where she came over just a little while ago. It was 104 when you left. <laughs> She's probably thinking, put the heater next to me and turn it up wide open. <laughs> Amen. Get me an electric blanket and wrap me an electric Snuggie. One of those Snuggie blankets. All right. Um, but he's as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. But I like this next verse, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions that are accomplished in your brethren, but that are in the world, also in the world. Satan's going around looking to take somebody out. But here Peter, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, says, resist him. How? In the faith. Submit yourself, therefore, to God resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now I know you've heard this before, but if you hadn't, I'm going to say it for you. And if you've heard it before, it's so good to hear it again. That in the Greek literally says this, he will flee from you as in terror. Faith scares him senseless. Amen. The devil is afraid of men and women of faith. He don't like faith because it puts his feet where his head was two seconds before. Amen. All righty. So the source of the problem is who? Yeah. Who? Yeah. Come on, come on, guys. Louder. The source of the problem is the? Yeah. Thank you. All right. But the source of the answer. <laughs> you know, it's good. To, you know, it's one thing to recognize where your problem's coming from. It's also good to recognize what the solution is. Now, there is nothing worse in church, in business, in marriage, in anything than a, than a, a whiner who does nothing but present what the problem is and never has a solution. I finally sometimes just look at him and say, you want some cheese to go with that wine? Okay, y'all are really... Y'all are going, I'm not going to let y'all eat anymore for church. <laughs> like y'all ready to go to sleep. Got warm in here. You get, I see your eyes rolling back in your head, you know. Hallelujah. First Corinthians, I mean, Second Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God. Well, that's a good thing to do. Stop right there. Isn't it good to give thanks to God? Amen. Come on, isn't it good to say, oh, thanks be to God? Amen. What for? Yeah, what are we thanking God for? 
which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. This tells me that the answer to my problem, the source of the answer to my problem, is God. Why? I'm to give him thanks because he always causes me to triumph. We have to recognize, if you recognize where the problem's coming from, and then you can recognize where the source of the answer comes from, guess what? You can win. Once you have the solution, it's a beautiful thing. Amen. Once you plug in the solution, it's wonderful. Everything makes sense once you solve it. Have you ever worked on a math problem and you couldn't figure it out, you couldn't figure it out, you couldn't figure it out, and then somebody sat down with you and showed you how it done and gave you the answer, and you looked at it and went, you've got to be kidding. Because you go, it was that easy. You look at it and your brain just goes, man, now that you see the solution, the whole problem makes sense. And how to answer, how to deal with the problem. Amen. God is your answer. He is the solution. You plug him into it and you can solve your problem. Amen. You, can, you, you are designed to win and you understand that God is your source of victory. Isn't that right? Psalm 46, 1. Now, I'm, I, I, can, I can pretty well guarantee you we're not going to finish this tonight. It's going to be over into uh, the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. Listen, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help <clears throat> in trouble. That means that God's not, right, God, God, God's not on the other side of the universe somewhere helping out some alien. Hello. God is our refuge. God is our strength. He's a very what? Present help in trouble. People get this mindset, and listen, the devil will isolate you. Uh, one of the things, you know, I used to watch, some of y'all remember this show, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins. Yeah, he was always, he was always way away going, and he had that monotone voice. He was standing there at the fireplace with the Mutual of Omaha symbol up there above him. And he was standing like this, talk in this real, we are now going to study the yellow belly platypus. The yellow belly platypus. I mean, he would just, just stay there. We're out in the field. My partner, Jim, is over with a man-eating lion. <laughs> But one of the things that you, yeah, watch it, watch him. <laughs> he was just demonstrating the culling method of herds. Now, 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 when you when you ever watch any of these, these African films of the in the wild in the in the Sahara, I mean, the Sahara, in the Serengeti or whatever, and you'll you'll see the the, the lions or the tigers uh, tracking. Um, uh, her animals in herds, what they always do is they call out the weaker. They keep chasing them until the weaker one gives up or gets separated from the herd and the herd can't protect it. And that's called culling. They're culled out. Um, and so it basically gets separated from. And see, the, the, you got to understand, Satan's always trying to separate you out by yourself. And what he wants you to do is to believe that you are by yourself. I'm the only one. Remember Elijah went out and was whining? And the Lord said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm the only one. Now, let's, 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 let's back up. I'm talking about culling. Think about what Elijah had done. I'm about to put my stool away tonight. This is just about not stool sermon. Can't really sit here too long with this. The, the preach wants to get on me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Think about this. Elijah had just finished what? <clears throat> Calling out the prophets of Baal. Remember that? Had, had, you know, had mocked them for days while they sat there and they, they prayed to their God. And he'd say, maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe he's in the bathroom. I mean, whatever. You know, when they had this challenge, the God answered by fire, let him be God. Remember that? And they prayed and they cut themselves and they did all this stuff for days and uh, nothing happened. 
Now, one of the reasons he, he set the sacrifice where he did, um, if you'll study historically, the, uh, they, they would deceive the people. They would have, they would say that the God, they would have, that their God's answered by fire. And they had dug tunnels and, and had uh, devices that would blow fire up and consume the sacrifices after they prayed. And so they, he went to a, a different place where they couldn't use their, I mean, listen, you got to remember, the, uh, some of these people were pretty, pretty smart. Actually, Adam was brilliant. It wasn't until the fall that man began to lose his, intel his, his IQ. We, what we have now is a remnant. We only use 10% of our brain capacity. I don't believe God created us to use 10%. I believe God created us in the beginning to use 100%, and I believe Adam did. Well, I don't know if I were. No, we're not evolving. We have devolved, and now through the new birth, are re-evolving. Man devolved. What do you think about that, Brother Bill? Yeah. yeah all right. Okay. Brother Bill, amen me. All right. And so, you know, the God that answers by fire, they cut themselves, they plead, they have 450 prophets of Baal. Elijah says, okay, out of the way, time for the big dog to show up. Here I am, prophet of God, real God on scene. As a matter of fact, go get a bunch of water and let's just let's soak the ground, let's soak the sacrifice, let's soak the wood, let's, I mean, just pour trenches and fill it up with water. Boom, two-minute prayer, boom, it's gone. Fire comes out of heaven, licks it all, I mean, it says it licks up the water, it just evaporates the whole thing. And then he kills 450 prophets. Man, you, know, you would think he'd be flying high. I mean, you're talking about a victory celebration. My God answered, killed the prophets of Baal, but a little horlet, hor horlet, harlot, a Santa Claus girl. Ho, ho, ho. All right. <laughs> <Some of you. laughs> that was just bad, wasn't it? All right. Anyway. Uh, a lady of the evening, lady of the evening, lady of the evening. That's right. That's what, that's what Larry, Larry the Cable Guy said. Um, she says, I'm going to kill him. And he runs and hides. God answers by fire, destroys, I mean, sucks up the whole sacrifice, kills 450 prophets, and a little harlot goes, I'm going to kill him. And he runs off and hides. <clears throat> and he's out there whining. I'm surprised the Lord didn't send him some cheese. And going, oh, Lord, kill me, take my life now. I, only I am left. This don't, this, I mean, think about this. He just got through heaven a miracle in killing 450 prophets by himself. And he's out here crying about he's the only one left. And God says, I've got 7,000 who've not bowed their knee to Baal. Now go, go anoint Elisha in your stead. Here, it's time to choose your replacement. <clears throat> the devil always tries to get us to think we're the only one. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes you, you have to watch this ministers who think they're the only one who has the message. God's only speaking through me. Hogwash. God don't just speak through one guy on the earth. There's not one guy who has the message for the whole planet by himself. They just not. You got people now right now that run around chasing one guy down right now. Oh, he's the only he's the only one preaching the truth. People used to say that about Dad Hagen. He he wouldn't he wouldn't let him get away with it if he heard it. But you know people. Oh, he's the only one. No, he wasn't. There are Baptist preachers that were preaching stuff that were, that was important. Did y'all know that? Brother Hagin's the only one that was preaching the truth. That's not true. And he would tell you that. Hello? And you can't, can't you, know, you can get this, this uh, identity thing where you're the only one who's serving God right. And you better watch out because you'll become the most judgmental person on the planet. Unless you're doing it my way and living like me, you're the, then you're not right because I'm right. I'm the only one. You've got to be careful about that. But on the other side of that, you got to be careful about becoming despondent and that you're the only one who cares. I'm the 
only one who cares about these people. No, God's got people who care about those people. Amen. So we have to be, we have to watch those things. So where was it? For, Psalm forty six one. Okay. Well, so anyway, here he is. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. And God says I got seven thousand. Satan, and, I, and my point is this: Satan always tries to call you out into the place. Of, of isolation that I'm the only one. And I, every time I know, I've been around people who isolate themselves. They always get these weird revelations. God speaks to them about things that, you know, in ways that, that nobody else has ever had done for them. The Lord shows me this. The Lord showed me that. Well, well who, who, you, who you been? Well, I'm, I'm submitted to traveling minister so-and-so. No, you're not. Give me a break. Leroy is not coming here to, 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 to uh, do whatever for you. But that isolation mindset is dangerous. Why? Because the Bible says God is a very present help. He's always there. You're never alone. You are never alone. Now, if you convince yourself you're alone, you might think you are, but you're not. Amen. There's always, and listen, there's always another Christian close by. Do y'all believe that God can speak to people or not? Amen. Do you believe that God can send somebody your way or not? Amen. We need to really start acting like the Bible's true again. And stop acting like, it, you know, well, I used to believe that when I first got saved. But, you know, I had this disappointment. I had that heartache. And I saw this and I saw that. So you're letting experience dictate to you what's real instead of letting God's word speak to you and tell you what's real. And you're going to have to overcome your experiences and submit them to the authority of the word of God. Amen. He is a very present help of trouble. Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not. Okay, well, that's great. Any good? You know, think, just stop. Don't keep reading ahead. Fear not. Well, that's easy. That's easier said than done. Yeah, but God just doesn't say fear not and leave you standing there dumbfounded like, well, why should I not fear? He tells you why you shouldn't fear. For, or you could put the word because here, I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. <clears throat> God says, fear not, and the reason you don't have to be afraid is what? He's with you. You are not alone. And this is probably not where I put my hands up here and they're probably right in front of the camera. That's great. Hey guys, you want to see my face? All right. I just realized that. He's, I'm sitting, we've got the camera set in a different place and stuff. And this, I'm going to put my hands up there and they're just blocking the camera. Hallelujah. God is with you. You're not called out. You're not by yourself. God's with you. Say, God's with me. Now, the fact that God is with you carries a greater connotation than that you're not singing um, Bobby Vinton's Lonely, I'm Mr. Lonely. It's not that you can just sit around and not be lonely. Hello? It is, he is with you for a reason. Amen. He goes on and says, don't be dismayed. Why? Because I'm your God. Isn't that right? He even says this, I will strengthen you, I'll help you, and I'll uphold you. Wow. <clears throat> I think it's good that when we, we start sensing that feeling of weak faith, the loss, a loss victory and we recognize and we say we step back and say hey, you know if the devil is the source of this thing satan is out to 
call me out and take me down. But God has already said, fear not, I'm with you. And then Jesus said this, I'm with you always, <clears throat> even unto the end of the world. Amen. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if he will never leave us, if he'll never forsake us, guess what he'll do? Never leave us or never forsake us. Which means that he'll never leave you, nor forsake you. Because he promised never to leave you, nor forsake you. Oh, I'll think about David. I love that. I love that passage. I was young. And now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging for bread. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Thank God for the faithfulness of God. God even said in his word, he says, if I, even if you are unfaithful, God abideth faithful. He can't be unfaithful to his covenant and to his word. So God's not going to lie. You got to understand, even if you feel like you've been called out and, you know, and, uh, and, the, and the, uh, the coyotes are taking you down one by one, God's with you. God's for you. Amen. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, thank God there is one greater. Greater than sickness and greater than disease and greater than poverty and greater than lack and greater than all of the enemies, you know, keep more song, all of the enemies' attacks. Amen? He's greater. He's on the inside of you. And he is greater. <laughs> he didn't say he's equal. Man, I don't know what's wrong with our little do doohickey there, but it's a, it's a tripping. <laughs> I felt like I was tripping with it, man. Hallelujah. So if we recognize the source, God, Satan's the problem, God's the answer. The second thing you need to do is this. Be sure the promises of God cover the things you ask for. I mean, can I say something? You're not going to have great faith believing for somebody else's wife. Sorry. Why? Because um, you've heard Dad Hagen say this, but he, Bosworth is where he got this from. Her Bo Bosworth said this. If it's Bosworth, faith begins with the will of God's known, and God's already said. Jesus said, and "That's God." Man, if you look on another woman to lust after her, you committed adultery in your heart already. That's not a compliment. And that's not. A, that's not a free. Go ahead and do it. That's not a get out of jail free car. Oh, it's okay to believe somebody else's wife. God said that's okay. Because you're in the grace. No, nah, don't work. You can't believe somebody else's wife. And if you do stupid stuff like that, you'll mess up your thinking about faith. Like I said one time, you know, people, people walk around, I'm believing God for $10 million. They can't believe God for 10 cents. Hello? They haven't even developed their faith to believe for, for a dime. They go around telling everybody they're believing God for $10 million. Everybody goes, all right, I'm with you, brother. You know what y'all do is say, well, when, when's the last time you believed for $20? When's the last time you believed for $50? Because if you can't believe for $20 or $50 or $100 or $300, you can't believe God for $10 million. You hurt yourself by exaggerating things instead of starting out and believing God in the things he's leading you to believe him in at the, at the place you are. And growing. Remember it talks about ever increasing faith. Growing in faith. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Amen. Going up, taking steps up. Ever increasing faith. It increases. But you don't start out at $10 million and you just can't even believe God to, to get an oil change. And what happens is, 
and then people get silly and start believing God for stuff the Bible doesn't promise them. Now, bless our darling hearts and stupid heads. I, I, I came into the word of faith pretty much at its pinnacle. Late 70s, early 80s. You know, of, of the confession and the, you know, we believe, you know, we just, we just, we believe God, we believe God for everything. Yeah, people believe that Mount Everest is going to get put in the ocean. Jesus did use the mountain being put in the sea and the sycamine tree being put in the sea as figurative speech. He wasn't literally talking about going and putting Mount Everest in the ocean. Number one, there's no reason. Plus, there's a lot of people who kind of like it where it is. Amen. Thirdly, I look at Jesus and his ministry, and I don't see him doing stupid stuff like that. <coughs> it was figurative speech. Don't you think if it was really what you could be doing, Jesus would have been low, straightening out all the roads and, and took all the hills out, got rid of, I mean, he, he, he would have left Israel uh, looking like the Napa Valley. No rocks, no stones. Now he's using figurative speech. All right. So find scripture that, that promises you what you're believing for. Not just saying, spouting stuff out that I'm believing God for a one million dollar automobile. And you're out there on a Vespa. A used Vespa. With a burnout muffler. And bald tires. And it don't even go meep meep anymore. It goes eh. Y'all, who knows what a Vespa is? The little bitty motorcycle things that don't have to have license tags on them. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes out hearing and hearing by the word of God. Find, see, if you're, listen, if you're going to have victorious faith, amen, strong faith that gets the victory and gets the answers, you've got to find scriptures that cover what you're believing for. I've seen people just purport stuff with no scripture. Hello? Here's a good one. How many have read the book by Fred Price called Faith, Foolishness, or Presumption? Raise your hand if you ever read the book. For, okay, three of you. Okay. Okay. Maybe we need to get that book in the bookstore again and sell it to you. <laughs> Brother Price came and said, some lady came one day and said she was, she was um, fairly obese. No, they invited them over to dinner. That's what it was. When they come to the house, and uh, she sat down before the meal. She said, Lord, we thank you for the food. And I cast all the calories out in Jesus' name. And then proceeded to eat like a pig. You can't cast calories out of food. How about this one? One couple came into that was Fred Price's office, and they were sitting there across from his desk, and she's pregnant. And they got talking and said, well, Brother Price, we, we come, we, we need counsel, we don't understand something. And uh, he says, okay, well, what is it? She says, well, my wife's pregnant. Okay. Well, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Well, we were believing God she wouldn't get pregnant. Were you uh, using any kind of protection? No, we were using our faith. You, you can't, oh, see, the scripture says, be fruitful and multiply. So if you engage in the activity that multiplies, there's a scripture higher than your confession. Hello. You don't have a scripture that says, believe God, your spouse won't get pregnant when you're engaging in marital relations and she won't get pregnant. You have one that says, multiply. Hello. <clears throat> well, see, that's, that's the stuff that messes you up and gets you, gets you off because then you become disheartened. And listen, this was, uh, somebody actually came in the office and said that. You think, it's like the girl back in our home church who put her books out in the, in the student commons at East Carolina University. Not exactly at that time, you know, the, 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 the greatest in the world. They've gotten better and told her angels to protect her books. While she went off and played around the student commons and went down to the bowling alley and just went around and did all kinds of stuff around campus and came back and lo and behold, the angel was off duty because the books were gone. 
That girl's mother stood up with my pastor in the middle of a church service and stood him down. That, that, that God had let her down because the angels didn't stay there and watch them books. And all you can think is, man, is this a taping of Rod Serling and the Twilight Zone? You can't tell angels to guard your books when you, guard, when you should be guarding your books. You know, the, the, you know, well, yes, you can. He gave his angels the, the, the charge of it to bear the other side dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, it's also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Amen. So find scripture. Second Peter 1. Four. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Second Corinthians chapter one verse eighteen. Now, so the scriptures are given to us to help us escape the, the, the corruption that's in the world. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter one verse eighteen. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, I believe it is Weymouth's translations. Weymouth's translation. This says all the promises of God. Look at that. All the promises of God, whatever their number, find the yes in him. And our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. Amen. When we go to the word of God and we have promises, the answer is always yes from the word. Always yes when it comes from the word. Now, I grew up good Pentecostal holiness boy. And they get real spiritual. I mean, I remember we, we, we had a whole, we had a revival in that church. I and mean, we had a whole slew of late teen, early 20 people get saved all at the same time. Got turned on to the Lord, on fire for Jesus. I mean, turned on. But then, you know, one, one, one of the young people said, we, we had discussions. They go, yes, God, they, they grew up in the church. God answers prayer three ways. Everybody's, oh, yeah. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes maybe. And then I ran across this scripture one day that said all the promises of God in him are yes. You having a hard time finding it? Not Weymouth? Verse 20 is not Weymouth? What's it say? Yep. For all the promises of God, whatever the number, have their, okay, they're kind of not the yes, the, see, now the margin of the Weymouth, that's why I was, uh, he's probably good to find that, have their confirmation in him. Now, Weymouth puts a sub note there, and then his note says, literally, the yes. Okay, so if you're reading the Weymouth Bible, Right there, he'll go, um, all the promises of God, whatever their number, have their confirmation or his, in his side notes, the yes in him. And for this reason, through him, uh, also our amen, Brother Bill, I'm going to have to move. You have to readjust your camera. I can't, there we go. Just enough to get over here so I can see the, um, also our amen acknowledges their truth and promotes the glory of God through our faith. Amen. Notice here that all the promises of God, whatever their number, have their confirmation or, which would be the yes, in him. So what does God say about his promises? Yes. It sounds so spiritual to go, oh, all, you know, God answers prayer sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes maybe. And uh, uh, he answers it yes. Because I'm going to make a statement here. And this is why people get into trouble with their faith, seeming weak and their victory loss, is they're trying to pray things that aren't scriptural. They're trying to pray out things that God doesn't condone, support, or promise. And guess what? 
number one, it won't work. But most of the biggest point I want to make here is praying something that's not scriptural is not prayer. It's not a, it's not a biblical confession. It's not scriptural. It's, it's just, what it is, is it t really, it's your attempt to manipulate God into doing something you want that, that the Bible doesn't promise you. It is not, see, well, I was praying the other day and asking God, well, biblical prayer is based on the Word. Amen? The only, the only way you can get around something that's not really written in the Word maybe is in the prayer of consecration and dedication, kind of like Jesus did. Remember when he went to the Father and said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Now, he, now he, did, he knew what he had to do. And the scripture was he had, to, he had to drink of the cup. But he said, if there's another way, let it pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. In other words, he knew praying against drinking of that cup was not the will of the Father. But he, he, in, in, the, in the process of that, he committed to the will of the Father. It is not prayer to pray contrary to the Word. It can be begging, whining, griping, complaining, manipulating, but it ain't prayer. And everybody said, oh me. Amen. But I've seen people pray things that the Word doesn't promise them. And then they start getting whiny and, and, and down and out because God didn't. God can't answer your prayer. <clears throat> God answers on the basis of faith. God does not may answer on the basis of your whining and complaining. It is upon the grounds of faith that we, we, we present ourselves to the Father. How do you know that? Because without faith it's impossible to please Him. For they that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. And so there's no way around it. You have to, it has to be based on faith. It has to be based on what the word says. Amen. I'm sorry. I had the eight wingmouth right here in front of me. <laughs> so I'll read that all to you now that I, I, I didn't see it in my notes. I was so busy. I was out there on my own. Verse 18, as certainly as God is faithful, our language to you is not now yes and now no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he who was proclaimed among you by us, that is by Silas and Timothy and myself, did not, listen, I love this, did not show himself a waverer between yes and no. This is, this is uh, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 2 Corinthians 1 in the Weymouth. He did not show himself a waverer between yes and no, but it was and always is with him and always is yes with him for all the promises of God whatever their number have their confirmation in him and for this reason um, through him also our amen acknowledges their truth and promotes the glory of God through our faith notice it says Jesus did not present himself as a waiver between yes and no he's always yes what when you come according to the word now if faith seems weak and victory lost make sure you're using biblical promises to get what you're asking for Amen. Come on. Amen. Lord, I want you to turn my leaves into $100 bills in Jesus' name. Now, I know you're looking at everything and it just can't be people that crazy. Oh, honey, there are people that crazy. There are people who do stuff under the guise of faith that you just can't, wouldn't believe some of the stuff that people do. Amen. Some people could talk some stuff, man. They can talk some spiritual smack and not walk in any of it. God is not going to bless your hands in the realm of faith if you don't walk in love. Hello? God's not going to bless you. And you're not, and listen, you're not going to have biblical faith if you don't submit yourself to authority. That one ever big. But find scripture that covers what you're asking for. 
<clears throat> you can't go, Lord, heal me because you healed Pastor Ed last week. And you're not a respecter of persons. Well, but you're basing it on the fact that he did something for me. Remember, remember Peter and James, James and John, all them were sitting around with Jesus and the disciple whom Jesus loved was laid his head on his chest. Remember that, that story? And Jesus starts asking Peter, you know, look, uh, you love me? He said, I love you more than these. He said, feed my sheep. And then, you know, and they had this conversation back and forth. And, and um, finally, Peter, you know, and, and Peter looks at him and says, well, what about him? <laughs> about John. And Jesus says, what is it to you that if I will that he stay here until I return, feed my sheep? And he had talked to him about how he would die. He had to be stretched forth, you know, and of course Peter was crucified upside down. And uh, you know what? There was a situation. You couldn't use your faith. Well, so Jesus said, what if I will that he stay here until I come back? You do what I told you to do. Just because the Lord did something for me doesn't mean he'll do exactly that same thing for you. Unless you're using the word of God to get what you need. And it's based on what the word says, not that he did it for me. You can't put your faith based on what, what the Lord did for somebody else. Your faith has to be based on what the Lord promised you in his word. Because that's where faith works. And that's where faith comes from. It doesn't come because God did some good. Because people do that stuff all the time. The Lord got Benny a new car. Bless God, I'm going out and buying me one too. Because he, if he did it for Benny, he'll do it for me. And you bless yourself. Now you're going to have to work an extra 20 hours a week for the next four years to pay for your blessing. Hello. Because it wasn't based in faith. It was based on really jealousy and, and envy. Fine promises. Okay. So we're, we're th we'll pick up two weeks from tonight, okay? Fine promises that cover what you ask for. Amen.